The Third Voyage of Sinbad After a very short time, the pleasant life I led made me quite forget the perils of my first two voyages. Moreover, as I was still in the prime of life, it pleased me better to be up and doing, so once more, providing myself with the rarest and choicest merchandise of Baghdad, I conveyed it to Balsora and set sail with other merchants of my acquaintance for distant lands. We had touched at many ports and made much profit when one day upon the open sea we were caught by a terrible wind which blew us completely out of our reckoning and lasting for several days finally drove us into harbor on a strange island. I would rather have come to anchor anywhere than here, quoth our captain. This island and all adjoining it is inhabited by hairy savages who are certain to attack us, and whatever these dwarves may do we dare not resist, since they swarm like locusts, and if one of them is killed the rest will fall upon us and speedily make an end of us. These words caused great consternation among all the ship's company, and only too soon were we to find out that the captain spoke truly. There appeared a vast multitude of hideous savages, not more than two feet high and covered with reddish fur. Throwing themselves into the waves, they surrounded our vessel, chattering meanwhile in a language we could not understand and clutching at ropes and gangways, they swarmed up the ship's side with such speed and agility that they almost seemed to fly. You may imagine the rage and terror that seized us as we watched them, neither daring to hinder them nor able to speak a word to deter them from their purpose, whatever it might be. Of this we were not in long left doubt, Hoisting the sails and cutting the cable of the anchor, they sailed our vessels to an island which lay a little further off, where they drove us ashore. Then, taking possession of her, they made off to the place from which they had come, leaving us helpless upon a shore avoided with horror by all mariners, for a reason which you will soon learn. Turning away from the sea, we wandered miserably inland, finding as we went various herbs and fruits which we ate, feeling that we might as well live as long as possible, though we had no hope of escape. Presently we saw in the far distance what seemed to be to us a splendid palace towards which we turned our weary steps, but when we reached it we saw that it was a castle, lofty and strongly built, Pushing back the heavy ebony doors, we entered the courtyard, but upon the threshold of the great hall beyond it we paused, frozen with horror at the sight which greeted us. On one side lay a huge pile of bones, human bones, and on the other numberless spits for roasting. Overcome with despair, we sank tremblingly to the ground and lay there without speech or motion. The sun was setting when a loud noise aroused us. The door of the hall was violently burst open, and a horrible giant entered. He was as tall as a palm tree and perfectly black, and had one eye which flamed like a burning coal in the mist of his forehead. His teeth were long and sharp and grinned horribly, while his lower lip hung down upon his chest, and he had ears like elephant ears, which covered his shoulders and nails like the claws of some fierce bird. At this terrible sight our senses left us, and we lay like dead men. When at last we came to ourselves, the giant sat examining us attentively with his fearful eye. Presently, when he had looked at us enough, he came towards us, and stretching out his hand, took me by the back of the neck, turning me this way and that, but, feeling that I was mere skin and bone, he set me down again and went on to the next, whom he treated in the same fashion. At last he came to the captain, and finding him the fattest of all, he took him up in his one hand and struck him upon a spit and proceeded to kindle a huge fire, 
at which he presently roasted him. After the giant had supped, he lay down to sleep, snoring like the loudest thunder, while we lay shivering with horror the whole night through, and when day broke he awoke and went out, leaving us in the castle. When we believed him to be really gone, we started up bemoaning our horrible fate until the hall echoed with our despairing cries. Though we were many and our enemy was but one, it did not occur to us to kill him, and indeed we should have found that a hard task, even if we had thought of it. And no plan could we devise to deliver ourselves. So at last, submitting to our sad fate, we spent the day in wandering up and down the island, eating such fruits as we could find, and when night came, we returned to the castle, having sought in vain for anywhere else to shelter. At sunset, the giant returned, supped upon one of our unhappy comrades, slept and snored till dawn, and then left us as before. Our condition seemed to us so frightful that several of my companions thought it would be better to leap from the cliffs and perish in the waves at once, rather than await so miserable an end. But I had a plan of escape, which I now unfolded to them, and which they at once agreed to attempt. Listen, my brothers, I added, you know that plenty of driftwood lies along the shore. Let us make several rafts and carry them to a suitable place. If our plot succeeds, we can wait patiently for the chance of some passing ship, which would rescue us from this fatal island. If it fails, we must quickly take to our rafts, frail as they are. We have more chance of saving our lives with them than we have if we remain here. All agreed with me, and we spent the day in building rafts, each capable of carrying three persons. At nightfall we returned to the castle, and very soon in came the giant, and one more of our number was sacrificed. But the time of our vengeance was at hand. As soon as he had finished his horrible repast, we lay down to sleep as before, and when we heard him begin to snore, I and nine of the baldest of my comrades rose softly and took each a spit, which we had made red hot in the fire, and then, at a given signal, we plunged it into the giant's eye in one single accord, blinding him completely. Uttering a terrible cry, he sprang to his feet, clutching in all directions to try to seize one of us, but we had all fled in different ways as soon as the deed was done, and thrown ourselves flat upon the ground in corners where he was not likely to touch us with his feet. After a vain search, he fumbled about till he found the door and fled out of it, howling frightfully. As for us, when he was gone, we made haste to leave the fatal castle and, stationing ourselves besides our rafts, we waited to see what would happen. Our idea was that if, when the sun rose, we saw nothing of the giant and no longer heard his howls, which still came faintly through the darkness, growing more and more distant, we should conclude that he was dead and that we might safely stay upon the island and need not risk our lives upon the frail rafts. But at last, morning came and showed us our enemy approaching us, supported on either hand by two giants nearly as large and fearful as himself, while a crowd of others followed close upon their heels. Hesitating no longer, we clambered upon our rafts and rowed with all our might out to sea. The giants, seeing their prey escaping them, seized up huge pieces of rock and, wadding into the water, hurled them after us with such good aim that all the rafts except the one I was upon were swamped and their luckless crew drowned without our being able to do anything to help them. Indeed, I and my two companions had all we could do to keep our own rafts beyond the reach of the giants. 
but by dint of hard rowing we at last gained the open sea. Here we were at the mercy of the wind and waves, which tossed us to and fro all that day and night. But the next morning we found ourselves near an island, upon which we gladly landed. There we found delicious fruits, and having satisfied our hunger, we presently lay down to rest upon the shore. Suddenly we were aroused by a loud rustling noise, and starting up, saw that it was caused by an immense snake which was gliding towards us over the sand. So swiftly it came that it had seized one of my comrades before he had time to fly, and in spite of his cries and struggles speedily crushed the life out of him and its mighty coils, and proceeded to swallow him. By this time my other companion and I were running for our lives to some place where we might find hope to be safe from this new horror, and seeing a tall tree we climbed up into it, having first provided ourselves with a store of fruit of the surrounding bushes. When night came I fell asleep, but only to be awakened once more by the terrible snake, which after hissing horribly round the tree at last reared itself up against it, and finding my sleeping comrade who was perched just below me, it swallowed him also and crawled away, leaving me half dead with terror. When the sun rose, I crept down from the tree with hardly hope of escaping the dreadful fate which had overtaken my comrades. But life is sweet, and I determined to do all I could do to save myself. All day long I toiled with frantic haste and collected quantities of dry brushwood, reeds, and thorns, which I bound with faggots, and making a circle of them under my tree, I piled them firmly one upon the other until I had made a kind of a tent, which I could crouch like a mouse in a hole when she sees the cat coming. You may imagine what a fearful night I passed, for the snake returned eager to devour me and glided round and round my frail shelter seeking an entrance. Every moment I feared that it would succeed in pushing aside some of the faggots, but happily for me, they held together, and when it grew light, my enemy retired, baffled and hungry to its den. For me, I was more dead than alive. Shaking with fright and half suffocated by the poisonous breath of the monster, I came out of my tent and crawled down to the sea, feeling that it would be better to plunge from the cliffs and end my life at once, than pass such another night of horror. But to my joy and relief, I saw a ship sailing by, and by shouting wildly and waving my turban, I managed to attract the attention of her crew. A boat was sent to rescue me, and very soon I found myself on board, surrounded by a wandering crowd of sailors and merchants eager to know by what chance I found myself in that desolate island. After I had told my story, they regaled me with the choicest food the ship afforded, and the captain, seeing that I was in rags, generously bestowed upon me one of his coats. After sailing about for some time and touching at many ports, we came at last to the island of Salhat, where the sandalwood grows in great abundance. Here we anchored, and as I stood watching the merchants disembark their goods and preparing to sell or exchange them, the captain came up to me and said, I have here, brother, some merchandise belonging to a passenger of mine who is dead. Will you do me the favor to trade with it, and when I meet his heirs, I shall be able to give them the money, though it will be only just that you shall have a portion for your trouble. I consented gladly, for I did not like standing by idle. Whereupon he pointed the bales out to me and sent for the persons whose duty it was to keep a list of goods that were upon the ship. When this man came, he asked in what name the merchandise was to be registered. In the name of Sinbad the Sailor, 
replied the captain. At this, I was greatly surprised, but looking carefully at him, I recognized him to be the captain of the ship upon which I had made my second voyage, though he had altered much since that time. As for him believing me to be dead, it was no wonder that he did not recognize me. So, Captain, said I, the merchant who owned these bales were called Sinbad? Yes, he replied. He was so named. He belonged to Baghdad and joining my ship at Bassora, but by mischance he was left behind on a desert island where we had landed to fill up our water casks, and it was not until four hours later that he was missed. By that time the wind had freshened, and it was impossible to put back for him. You suppose him to have perished, then, said I. At last, yes, he answered. Why, Captain, I cried, look well at me. I am that Simbad. I am the one who fell asleep upon the island and awoke to found himself abandoned. The captain stared at me in amazement, but was presently convinced that I was indeed speaking the truth, and rejoiced greatly at my escape. I am glad to have that piece of carelessness off my conscience at any rate, said he. Now take your goods and the profit I have made for you upon them, and may you prosper in future. I took them gratefully, and as we went from one island to another, I laid in stores of cloves, cinnamon, and other spices. In one place I saw a tortoise which was twenty cubits long and as many broad, also a fish that was like a cow and had skin so thick that it was used to make shields, another I saw that was like a camel in shape and color. So by degrees we came to Balsora, and I returned to Baghdad with so much money that I could not count it, besides treasures without end. I gave largely to the poor and bought much land and added to what I already possessed, and thus ended my third voyage. When Sinbad had finished his story, he gave another hundred sequins to Hinbad, who then departed with the other guests. But the next day, when they had all reassembled and the banquet was ended, their host continued his adventures. The end for now. We'll continue that next time we're doing Arabian Nights and the Voyages of Sinbad the Sailor. Hope you'll have a great week.